Pro, how do you, uh, before you do, uh, it's wonderful to be talking to you today. And I look forward to uh, having a further conversation to see how we can take some of these ideas I'm going to present and see how we might take them a little bit forward and introduce them. But um, my journey uh, is a very kind of non-traditional journey. And hopefully you will benefit from some of the insights that I have done as a traveler, as a practitioner of innovation, um, but more importantly, just as someone who's just quite curious about uh, innovation and how to make it thrive and flourish in uh, all communities. Uh, my name is Greg Horowitz. And as you can see, I have uh, um, several different affiliations, but that affiliation that I kind of cherish the most is that of an innovation wanderer and just somebody who uh, uh, loves to explore and understand how to kind of help others on this journey. Um, today, it's very difficult to pick up any kind of a business book or book on how to create the future without the word innovation being a prime piece of the conversation. And yet we use the word so much. And yet as the more we use it, the more we realize we don't quite understand it. Um, in going to a lot of the top academics of the time, I went with a single uh, question. Uh, and as Lao Tzu says, normally the, uh, the, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. But in my case, it began with this question, which is, if we have the ability to understand what is good for us in the economy, then why don't we use it? In other words, if everyone's writing about innovation and how to create innovation communities, why do we still not see more of them happening, particularly to the scale and impact that some of the places that have practiced this well do? And that kind of confused me because what I was realizing on my journey of helping people with innovation is that 99% of what it truly takes to make innovation happen is completely invisible. It's not the four walls of our incubators. It's not the hard cash that we're handing to our entrepreneurs. Those are all very, very important and they enable the outcomes to happen. They're not, but they're not what makes it happen. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, a colleague of mine at Stanford University gave me a book called The Knowing Doing Gap by Bill Sutton and Jeff Pfeffer that all the lights seemed to go on because I said, knowing what to do and doing something are two very, very distinct things. And as much as we'd love to believe that human beings are just purely intellectual and rational and we do what's best for us and best for our communities, the fact is we're also emotional. We're sentient, we search for meaning. We do things that fulfill us and make us feel better about ourselves. And it's in that kind of uh, duality of what it means to be human that lies the true crux of how innovation can happen. Because it's only when what we think and what we feel agree with one another that it empowers us to do something in the next moment that we weren't doing in the previous moment. And what we were noticing is as we studied and practiced in different communities, we saw different kinds of business models and different kinds of behavior models at play. And the first model we saw were the production models that most people are familiar with because these are models um, based on resource extraction, taking very, very scarce ideas, time, and physical goods and services and trying to figure out what to do with them that makes them more valuable to the people who use them and eventually creates prosperity within a community. But as we were saying that these models are often based on the concepts of scarcity because we only have so much land and water or copper in our mines or, or uh, fields in which to plant uh, our crops that we try to be very precise and predictable about what we do, which is why we build models that look like this, what we might call a farm or a plantation, or in this case, a vineyard. And the reason we use this to illustrate is because as you can see, when you look at this picture, you know exactly what we're trying to do, but also your, uh, um, your eyes are brought to how nice and pristine and linear they are because this linearity creates the most efficiency. We don't waste anything in this picture. We try to ag uh, water our crops in a very specific way. We plant them in a certain way to make it easier to harvest. And we produce this over and over again, whether it's the same model we use to produce cars, 
or even in the military industrial complexes, or even today, the way we produce silicon chips is exactly the same way. There's an efficiency and a scale that gets achieved by this. And by the way, not only do we do this for that, but we also hire people into our businesses who are prized because they don't make mistakes. When we bring them into our companies, they have a certain pattern recognition and a certain expertise that allows them to predict and repeat a certain action over and over again that enforces that efficiency and maybe even increases it, but also eventually creates profitability for the companies that benefit from that. But we were seeing another model at play that was equally, if not more important. And instead of being um, based on this model of physical resource extraction, it was built on knowledge extraction, uh, which is why we call them models for creative systems. And instead of models of scarcity, where whatever resources we are working with eventually went to zero, these are models built on abundance, where when you and I get together to share ideas for a coffee, for a conversation, when we walk away from that conversation, we both leave with more than we came with. So theoretically, knowledge and ideas are a renewable resource. And because of that, the more we share, the more we collaborate, the more we have conversations, the more we create. And we take this instead of to zero in the first model, we take our knowledge and resources to nearly infinity. And that's why I like this quote from Matt Ridley, who says, innovation is really about ideas having sex. It's about combining ideas and recombining them. And it's only in that combination that we get new things, new thinking, new products, new services, new ways of helping our communities, new insights for what we might do to advance ourselves. And we call these models rainforests because where in the first model was very linear and precise and we looked at it and we knew what we were doing. In this model, we kind of don't know what they are. They're a bit messy. Uh, they're certainly pretty, they're diverse. But if I asked you what was the most important thing that exists in the rainforest, we wouldn't necessarily be able to answer that right away. And I would argue that probably the most important thing we're looking at are the things we're standing on, the weeds. These are the Googles, the Facebooks, that when first they present themselves, we don't know what they are or what they're supposed to do. So our first instinct is to pull them out and put them to the side because they may be competing for the very resources that we thought we were preserving for other things. But not only are these companies a bit odd, but the people who work in these companies can appear to be odd. They don't look like what we're used to before. And these are the people who truly change the world the, these people and their ideas are the weeds. And that's why it's so tough to do innovation because this quote references that very often we look at these people different and it's not because uh, um, they're doing something bad, they're just doing something we don't understand. And that's why we tend to either marginalize or forget about them and put them to the side. But these are the people again who change and they're in lies what we call the paradox of innovation. That innovation truly only becomes an innovation once someone begins using it, sharing it, imitating it, and that's when we truly adopt it. So it's always a market or a social side metric, never a user metric at the front end. We can certainly be inventive or creative early on, but it's not an innovation until we hand it to someone. And I'd argue that if you go to people and ask them, if, they, if this new invention represents a true innovation, you will consistently get answers probably of no, it's not. Because most of the experts of any point in time, when you present them with a new potential reality, they will always default to the existing reality by saying, oh, this doesn't make sense. Whether it's the telephone or whether it's us being able to create a, a, a flight, uh, or even you would think we would get smarter, but even the way we make computers today, people are saying, nah, we probably don't need a personal computer. It just doesn't make sense. So why, that's why we realized that to teach innovation and entrepreneurship, we need to teach people how to better use their imaginations as opposed to just merely their knowledge. Because knowledge will help them with what is and perhaps what has been, but it's not as an effective tool as imagination for what can be. And which is why 
in the first model, we said, gee, we really want to hire people who don't make mistakes. In an innovation company, you know who I want to hire? I want to hire people who are creative problem solvers. Because the future may not really be clear. And what we need to do to create the future may not yet exist. So we must manifest it and bring it into being. So as Thomas Edison said, it's not that I have failed. I've just found many ways not to do something. And those many ways of not to do something become knowledge that then we share with the world that allow us to do it, which is why we generally don't like this concept of mistakes or failures. We use the term unintended outcomes or unexpected outcomes, because that's all they really are at the time. They're just ways that don't uh, uh, serve us, which is why we can't let it define who we are. We as entrepreneurs have to be able to move forward beyond those uh, unexpected outcomes, use us as knowledge to figure out not necessarily what not to do again, but what we may try to do. And that therein lies the first rule of innovation is that you can't actually make innovation happen. The best you're gonna be able to do is increase the chances of it happening. So going back to the models of what we call the farm or the plantation in the rainforest, in the plantation, we're really trying to engineer process because that process helps us become more efficient and prosperous. But in the rainforest, what we're trying to do is engineer environment, engineer serendipity, the chances for those collisions to come together. The other thing we have to understand is that all innovation is truly human centric. We build things for other people. People use these technologies. Technologies cannot be good or bad. It's only in how we use these things that determines their usefulness to us. And so therefore we have to understand the very human centered aspects of the actions it takes to drive a prosperous outcomes. And normally when we look at an action or an outcome we're trying to do, we focused here by saying, gee, if we want more startups, maybe we need to build more incubators. Maybe we need to create more capital available to fund these companies. And this is where we tend to focus over and over again. But what we found is that what we see in innovation ecosystems is that all of the actions that people take are really informed by their attitudes, their behaviors, their intentions. And most of those things are actually focused on their belief systems. And this is where we should focus our attention on how do we create an entire belief in innovation within an organization or a community? How do we get people to believe of certain things because that's what we found about places that do it really well. Because when you believe something, you don't have to be constantly reminded that that is your belief. But if you don't believe something, no matter how much I give you new evidence of it, you're still not gonna believe it. And we see this play out in the world now, both in our politics and our conversations within our companies. We see this playing out over and over again. And so belief really becomes uh, the core of this, because Silicon Valley, we think of just as a place, but is really the state of belief. And when you go there, remember I said that 99% of innovation is invisible. You can't really touch it, but what you can do is you can experience it. You can sense it. And that becomes part of that belief. You watch people doing things that ordinarily you would not see people doing in another place. And you'd ask yourself, why are they doing that? when in another place, maybe a few hundred miles away or halfway across the world, they don't do it that way. And this was part of the epiphany that we had, this kind of difference between what we call designing innovation ecosystems versus engineering these. It was the epiphany. And I'm sorry to pick on someone like a Bill Gates or Steve Jobs for this, but it's more for an illustration that Historically, a lot of technological innovation came from the engineering side of things. We looked at a problem and then we figured out how to use all the technology we did to get to a solution. And so we focused more predominantly on the utility, on how it worked. And we figured that if we could solve a problem and make it efficiently to solve that problem, that would be all it would take to create utility of it. But what Apple showed us was something different that people cared for something even more than just the utility of a product. They cared about how it made them feel and how it connected to them. And so design became a preeminent thing that instead of engineering companies who engineered first and then designed later, companies like Apple flipped that paradigm and said it was really about how we design what we do and then engineer it. That people would relate to it. 
And therein lied what, what uh, uh, Steve Jobs was able to create a company that was more of a religion. He got everyone in the world to, who used his product to act like they were an employee of the company without having to pay them to be an employee. In fact, quite the opposite. They paid him by buying their products. And that's why people line up to buy a brand new Apple product. And yet when a new uh, 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 competing product on a non-Apple platform gets released, people usually don't line up for it. And so it was really this kind of feeling because he realized that if you could give people what they desire, they would convince themselves it's what they need. And we're able to kind of conflate the needs and the wants together in, in this, that we believe something and we do it, which is why we say you can't just think like an economist in an innovation ecosystem. You also have to think like a psychologist, because if you can think about what makes people feel better, what empowers them, what gives them purpose, that is a far greater driver than just merely giving them tasks to do. Because as one of our great poet laureates of the United States said, uh, she said that I've learned that, that after people remember what you say and do, they're gonna remember how you made them feel. That's a much stickier kind of emotion and people will act on that motion. Now, what we also have to realize that to truly make innovation happen, there has to be a set of conditions and preconditions. So it really only happens when we're uncomfortable and when things are not clear, ambiguity and discomfort, because it's only when things are unclear and we're uncomfortable that we get up out of our chairs and we look for a new solution. Why am I feeling this way? How could I feel better? Because again, as much as we'd love to believe we're intellectual and rational, we're emotional and sentient. And our emotions will almost universally be able to override our intellect as we do this stuff. Um, and that's where the kind of search for what we do will happen because most of the great stuff never happens in where we're comfortable. It's often where we are uncomfortable because that is really the future. It tells us we're going into something new, something we haven't seen before. It's not just merely about pattern recognition, it's about novelty. And that's where the good stuff is. And also the people have to go beyond just being merely good or excellent we have to find entrepreneurs and create entrepreneurs who are extraordinary. And the difference between those two is that very often the future cannot be navigated in a very linear and predictable way. And this chart references um, a journey, but think of it like the difference between what we saw with Blockbuster and Netflix, two companies that both saw the future of video and on-demand entertainment where they went from instead of uh, DVD rentals or where you could walk into a physical location and get a DVD to put into your uh, machine to watch a movie to streaming where all of this content would exist somewhere else and on demand, we could pull it into our devices. Both companies saw the future at the same time. One was able to successfully navigate to it, one was not. What was interesting about the leaders of those organizations one tried to figure out what the most linear way of getting from where they were at to where they needed to go. And one of them realized that they couldn't, that it was not a linear journey because although they could see the future, the future actually existed on a different peak or mountaintop. And that very often the greatest skill you have to have is not learning how to climb hills, but how to cross valleys, how to deal with uncertainty, how to deal with new business models that you've never seen before how to experiment with new customer models that you haven't seen before. And therefore you often have to let go of your ego in order to achieve that new, which is why you can't only rely on the expertise. You also have to rely on a very different set of things. Now, when I said that you come to the Silicon Valley and most of it is invisible, you have to take all those things that you think are invisible and try to make them explicit. And an example of that is here in the Hewlett Packard garage in the Silicon Valley. You can see uh, that this was a very novel company. And even going back to 1939, they put out this rules of the garage, which described not what they were doing or how they would do it, but rather it described the values that they believed in. It described their version of their religion of what they believed about. And this created purpose in the employees it created a vision for the employees to follow so that people not only came in every day knowing what they were supposed to do, but more importantly, they understood why they were doing it. 
And that's why these kinds of social contracts become the real crux of success in the Silicon Valley rather than the mission statements and vision statements. Because as Peter Drucker said, your culture will eat your strategy for breakfast. And instead of thinking of your organization as just merely physical and hard assets that you deploy in a very predictable way, there's also a lot of software, so to speak, in your company where you generate the social friction and you dissipate the friction that really, it's not about the removal of a friction, it's about appreciating and figure out what to do with that friction uh, in a company. So therefore, you not only need to bring in people who are, have mere expertise into your company, you also need to bring people who are both uninformed and intelligent because the greatest innovations come not when we all agree, but when we disagree. When we have these conversations uh, that lead to uh, the not necessarily uh, consensus or compromise, but lead us to a collective thing that is more than what we could have achieved if we just gave in early enough. Um, the other thing we tell you about, you have to worry about what's called the Red Queen. And this, this refers to an effect that you move very, very fast to innovate, but you're actually only innovating at the rate that everyone else is innovating. And so when you get done running the race like the Red Queen does in Alice in Wonderland, you, you look to your side and you realize you really haven't gone anywhere. So to truly innovate, you have to do bold things that take you beyond rather than just merely at the same pace. That's not really innovating. That's just following really quest, uh, quickly. So where we really need to be is to move from the left-hand side of this column to the right-hand side of this column. Um, and I'll call out just a few of these things. You know, of course, moving from this institution-centric modeling that the institution is the prime mover in innovation to the human beings are the prime mover in innovation, that nothing happens without them doing something different, adopting a new mindset, adopting a new behavior, adopting a new habit of what they're doing. Um, uh, you'll see a, a one of the bullet points that says we espouse orthodox, uh, you have to move from espousing orthodoxy to living the orthopraxy. All that really means is in the old days, people would say, just follow the rules and do what I say. But what we find is that entrepreneurs and the people who follow them follow the person who actually does what they say. They live the practice of what they're doing and we find authenticity in that. So we want to join uh, their movement because they're doing what they say they're gonna do as opposed to just merely telling someone else to do it. Um, so these are kind of the rules that we see of the, what we call these rainforests and how they're different than the plantation. One, you always have to be prepared to break or bend a few rules and to dream very big. We often say that innovation is about audacious speculation, thinking big and often without proof that you can actually do it because innovation is truly about what is possible and plausible, not necessarily what is about predictable or probable. So it's very, very different. Um, you have to be willing to trust and be trusted. You have to experiment together because we, it's, uh, innovation is a very social journey. And it's always about trying to be fair to one another rather than to get an advantage over one another. And of course, to always try to persist and move forward. But most importantly, that whatever knowledge or benefits you gain, you must pay those forward. And that's one of the secrets also of the Silicon Valley is that when people have success, they don't leave and take that success out of the system. They reinvest it back into the system as mentors, as capital providers, um, and that you see this flywheel of people engaging over and over again. And this is just an example of a rainforest place that we put together. But I'll leave you with this thought that while it is absolutely true that without order, nothing can exist, it's also true that without chaos, nothing can evolve. And so it's not about giving up one system for the other, it's about feeling, figuring out how to get these two systems to work together, to make it sustainable, to make it uh, uh, purposeful and driven, to give us all a higher order of consciousness, but better intention about what we do and how to kind of then take this and put it to use in our societies in a way that benefits them in a way that we haven't been able to benefit them before, both at the very kind of discrete level, but also at the more existential levels. We take on these very complex challenges ranging from climate change to inequities in our society, 
to actually just solving very important industrial and community-based problems. So with that, I will uh, end my talk and thank you for listening.